patent clerk, Newtonian physics. Intellectual property really has been, for hundreds of years now, kind of a core part of how people both monetize and protect. And it's been interesting watching disruptive technologies, specifically cryptocurrency, which isn't really governed by patents or can't really be controlled by patents. And on the other hand, you've got things like 3D printing that made a lot of progress in just a couple of years, but it was only because some 20-year-old patents had expired, and now these parts were able to be made by just anybody who wanted to make them, as opposed to the one manufacturing conglomerate that, that had the legal right to be able to do it before that point. So I'm curious, you know, where do you think intellectual property controls can fit within a Bitcoin framework, and what impact would it have had if the situation had been different in the cryptocurrency space? So my own feeling on intellectual property is that it's, it's basically an, an artificial thing that can only exist in an age of the nation state and uh, that's governed by the physical world and the capacity of monopolistic elites to control the world through compulsion and coercion. And that's fundamentally at odds with the, which the digital age is all about about malleability, reproducibility, uh, immortality, and you know distributed networks. And th these are just the idea of some some elites, you know, g gathering together to allocate who owns what in, in the realm of ideas incompatible with this. And it's basically, I've, I've done a lot of work on the history of intellectual property, the the ideological structures surrounding it. It wasn't really until after the, the beginning of the 21st century that we saw hardcore, really serious attacks on the idea of IP. Now, it's because the digital networks really just kind of broke the system down. Uh, we saw some opposition to IP even as early as you know the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution, but nothing really substantial and serious until the digital age. Basically, I think the system is broken down and and is it isn't going to last. And it's very interesting to me too to see how large corporations are starting to realize this and stop putting so much energy and time into enforcing their their patents and their copyrights and starting to use the new networks of of you know open source cooperation and and the sharing economy to their advantage here here that's a great comment Jeffrey intellectual property is an artificial construct for monopolizing ideas and creating cartels around abstract concepts the basic problem is that no one really has an original thought that they conceived uh, completely by themselves without anybody else being involved. You know, innovation is simply extending the culture of four and a half million years one millimeter forward by combining all of the existing inputs and producing something slightly different, something that probably a few thousand other people have already done somewhere else. And the idea that you can take that and create a monopoly around it is, while originally envisioned as a way to reward creators, has ended up creating these islands of stagnant creativity and isolation by removing things from the culture. The age-old compact, if you like, the social compact that's, that's even encoded in the in U.S. Constitution, which is that Congress can secure you know, rights for creators in order to promote the arts and sciences. This idea that these patents and copyrights are of limited time, so that you take from the cultural zeitgeist, you enhance it or advance it a tiny bit, you get a short-term reward, and then you give it back to the public domain so that others can build upon it. And that compact then got perverted, starting with the Disney company who as soon as they saw their Mickey copyright running out, went to Congress and got it extended 73 times uh, until copyright essentially became infinite instead of limited times. Quite happy to take the Brothers Grimm and every other cultural story um, appropriate it for their own needs and then give nothing back to the popular culture, right? Take all of the stories of our ancestors, turn them into uh, copyright material, and then give nothing back by perverting the copyright law. And we've seen this happen across the, across the board in intellectual property. Well, open source breaks that cycle and it says it recognizes that collaboration and creation moves faster and innovation with collaboration moves faster. And if you give back to the community, the community will give back to you again and again and it creates this feedback loop of accelerating innovation, whether it's Linux 
or Wikipedia or a thousand other things that have come from it, especially now with the introduction of the Creative Commons law and licenses. Those are amazing things, and what they're showing is that there's a much better way to do it. I heard something last night that really intrigued me, because I've tried to understand like the best way to describe open source projects and what they mean. At, at the Bitcoin meetup last night, somebody said that the great thing about open source technology is that it, it sort of takes away the obligation we all feel to sort of constantly reinvent things, to constantly re recreate on our own from scratch. Uh, you know, all things, always reinventing the wheel in a world of intellectual property, as you say, requires absolute originality. But open source programming and open source everything allows us to sort of draw from the energies of others and take what's already been done and sort of build on top of them. So you have this sort of accumulating uh, capital that, that grows over time. I was trying to think of the right analogy. It's like as if as if you had a, a cake that is just you know, constantly so, sort of one cake baked by the whole world that's that's constantly getting ever better and ever more delicious. And the more people that eat it, there's ever more cake for ever more people rather than just sort of individual cakes by individuals constantly throughout history. You have sort of one big cake that everybody's constantly making better and testing and bringing their own ideas to it. I, I thought that was a really nice way to think about it. Yeah, the, the core fallacy at the at the heart of the concept of intellectual property is the word property, because one of the absolute characteristics of property is that if you have property and I take that property, you no longer have that property. It is by definition singular, unique, unitary, and not shareable. But if you have an idea and I copy that idea, we both have that idea. And if I give it to 10 more people, all 12 of us now have that idea and we can all build on it. And you lost nothing from the fact that I have the idea. It's not property. And it's not property because it's not tangible. It's not destroyable. It's infinitely copyable. If you have invented something and I copy that, then really what we're doing is doubling the rate of invention because at the end of the day, you didn't really invent something. You just expanded on thousands of years of culture. And your addition is standing on the shoulders of giants. Hasn't really raised the bar that much. The, the whole idea of property in the first place, as you say, comes about because of the existence of scarcity. I mean, it's a social construct we invented to stop conflicts, to deal with the problem of rival risk control over 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 the physical world. You know, once you once you migrate to the digital world and you get simultaneous consumption of all things with no depreciation of the of the original object, the property is no longer necessary. It becomes just an absurdity. You know, it's important to remember that in, in history, people have had mistaken views of property over all sorts of things. For example, in the 18th century and, and up until uh, the 19th, early part of the 19th century, people at least thought that uh, slaves were legitimate forms of property. In fact, there's a Fifth Amendment of the Constitution that was put in there to protect those property rights over other people, you know, and and now we recognize that was just a mistake. So in the 21st century, we're gradually realizing this is this is also a mistake to apply the term property to to the realm of ideas. But was it always a mistake? Because the arguments I hear both of you making basically revolve around now we have digital things, but that wasn't true even 30 or 40 years ago. So 200 years ago, when uh, intellectual property was getting started in this country in the in the United States, you know, I have it in my head that it actually might have served a purpose where, because the inventor you know was at the mercy of a manufacturing partner that might take years and might actually kick them out of the business because they don't control the the inventor doesn't control or have any claim to the very centralized and capital intensive means of production so Lincoln had a quote that I like um, he said patents added the fuel of interest to the fire of innovations and I wonder did they ever serve a purpose in your in your eyes Jeffrey I don't think, I don't know, I don't think so. And I think what we need to do is totally revise intellectual history. The origin of the steam engine was a similar kind of problem. I mean, there was a great innovation, then it got locked down by patents and nothing nothing happened of any value for another, you know, 10 or 20 years because everybody was sort of prohibited by law from adding to it. It was very interesting what happened with uh, even things like the cotton gin, you know, that who's that guy, Eli Whitney, supposedly invented it, but he, he didn't invent it. He, he improved it slightly, then got a patent on it and went around and spending the next 20 years cracking down, cracking 
its goals to prevent uh, innovation. He finally learned his lesson after he bankrupted himself, spending much money on patent lawsuits. It's the same thing with the stupid with the Wright brothers. I mean, they came up with a pretty cool little innovation that they gave him the title of, of being the first in flight, and then they spent the rest of their their whole lives enforcing the patents. Meanwhile, all other countries in the world actually improved airline technology. By the time World War One came along, the U.S. had the worst airplanes in the world because we had the tightest patent controls. <laughs> you know, yeah, I don't think the patents have actually served ever served any kind of uh, purpose, and we really need to revise our intellectual history. Adam, you said something very interesting about how maybe intellectual property is not really relevant in digital age, but it might have had relevance before. But I, I really feel like we should have known that IP was was not a good idea, even dating all the way back to the Gutenberg Bible. When the Gutenberg Bible came along, of course, there was no IP over the Psalms and the other texts that were being printed. But there was a confusion because people associated the ideas on the page with the physical property of the page itself. We didn't really couldn't really conceptualize the fact that these are really different products. I mean, the, the, the ideas in the book are part of the non-scale realm. The book itself is part of the scarce realm. So we have this kind of merging of these two things, one non-scarce and one scarce, and one beautiful thing called, called a book. But it took us a long time to sort of realize that we're dealing always with two realms, one scarce and one non-scarce. And we just didn't know it so fully and completely until the last few years. So Bitcoin emerged as a very hobbyist sort of thing, right? It was very, very amateur, very just experimental. Let's see what we can accomplish. We're doing this because it's neat that we can do this. And I, I recently read a book um, called The Master Switch by Tim Wu. And in mm -hmm. that he uh, tells a bunch of different stories of information empires as they uh, succeed and then fail. And one of the stories that he tells is about AM radio and FM radio. And AM radio strikes me very similarly to, to how Bitcoin emerged. And FM radio seems like maybe after the recent discussion about these uh, rules that are being made in New York, maybe that's the situation that everything that comes after will, uh, will fall under. So I'm curious, do you know this story? I'm not aware about it. It's been a while since I read uh, Tim Wu's book, so maybe you can remind me while we explain it to our listeners. It's a fairly lengthy thing, but the idea is, in the early days, a kid who wanted to set up a radio station could set up a radio station with one of these little crystal radio things, and it was a, it was a hobbyist thing that people did because it was fun. You could set up a broadcast and you could listen to things. And this was this was very new at the time. Basically, it took like 40 years to develop. But by that point, it had developed to quite a successful industry. And there were a variety of monopolies, actually, because at the time, the only way that you could get from, you could get a station from somewhere non-locally would be to use AT&T's long distance lines. And that actually was one of the reasons why FM radio was kind of suppressed, because FM radio came along and it essentially made it so ranges were such and power requirements were such such that before it was unfeasible with AM radio to do like rebroadcast stations where you, you know, broadcast from one hill and then it's rebroadcast from another hill. This, the range was too short and the power requirements were too great. But when FM radio came along, it essentially made it so that anybody who wanted to do this could very cheaply set up these networks of stations and rebroadcasters. And that was one of several reasons why the AM radio paradigm, which had actually invented the FM radio technology, had funded the research to do it, then sat on the technology. And so the FCC came along and said, in order to maintain the standard, you can use much less power than you could with an equivalent AM station so that it will only give you an AM equivalent broadcast distance. I, I'm rambling and doing a kind of terrible job with this, but it seems like sometimes, especially in the last hundred years, these are used as weapons to suppress technologies. It's not sometimes out of it. Every single time in every disruptive technology, the existing industries have used every weapon at their disposal uh, to fight for incumbency and to prevent disruption, which is, of course, a normal reaction, which then tells you what regulation does. Regulation starts off at least presumably or presented as uh, consumer protection, and it very quickly becomes a way to distinguish incumbents and to protect them from competition because they become adept at navigating the regulation, they co-opt the regulators, and then as soon as disruption happens, they turn the regulation around and point it as a big weapon at the disruptors, and that has happened in every industry. It's 
that's happening today in every industry. In the end, they never succeed. That's what's amusing. I mean, history progresses in any case. It's just that the regulators can slow us down, but they can't ultimately stop it, which which makes it just a, just a vast waste. I feel this way about a lot of these Bitcoin regulations that are coming out. It's like, it's going to make the, the sector function less well. It's going to make it less competitive. It's going to be less focused on the consumer and more focused on compliance, you know. But in the end, 50 years from now, none of these regulations that they're trying to pass right now are going to have any relevance for whether and to what extent Bitcoin adoptions takes place. Bitcoin's going to take its own course eventually. It's just a matter of how many victims you want to create in the, in the meantime. That's what it's all about. Well, but for New York, for example, again, we're talking about proposed rules here, uh, just real briefly, that essentially say that you have the same compliance requirements if you do anything with Bitcoin and users that have some basis in New York as you would if basically you're, you're a, a minor bank. Reporting requirements are very, very stringent, and it basically makes it so that with the current way cryptocurrency is, it's kind of incompatible to be compliant and to not create an entirely new cryptocurrency. So I've been wondering about that. I mean, it's kind of easy to create a new cryptocurrency. So if New York wants to go along with this this type of, uh, of means, doesn't it make sense to actually either, maybe not them, maybe somebody else does it, but create a cryptocurrency that actually complies with all of these requirements that they want, that has the real name stuff attached, and that doesn't require you to jerry-rig it, rather than using Bitcoin, where, yeah, you can use it, but you're throwing out all the advantages that, that came with it, so why buy I think that's mistaking uh, a bug for a feature for a bug. The mm -hmm. fact that Bitcoin is incompatible with these regulations, that's not a bug in Bitcoin. That's a feature. That's one of the best features in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. It's incompatible with these regulations because those regulations themselves express the existing paradigm, and that is exactly what Bitcoin is disrupting. But I'm going to call the you on this, Andreas, Bitcoin. because Bitcoin is neutral. So at the same time, you're kind of putting an ideology onto it that are saying that things. So so that's that's what I'm saying is no, no, Bitcoin I'm not. has the ideology no, baked into it. Can you twist that ideology and create something else that's very similar but that doesn't have that exact thing? No, what I'm saying is that Bitcoin is neutral, but Bitcoin is neutral in a way that violates the tenets of a very not neutral regulatory system that assumes that the best way to achieve consumer protection is to have all of the personally identifiable information of consumers given to several agencies with lax controls uh, so they can lord over it and supposedly stop bad guys. And what that does is actually destroys consumer consumer protection and privacy is consumer protection. The idea that by giving all your private information you will be protected as a consumer is perverse. And the fact that Bitcoin does not conform to that idea because it is neutral, because it allows consumers to interact without having to go through this perverse activity of giving up all their personal information just to transact. That's not a bug in Bitcoin. That is the feature that makes sure that Bitcoin will not fit into these comfortable regulations and it won't fit into the comfortable regulations because the regulations themselves are perverse. The right. idea that consumer protection is uh, ensured by taking all the private information of consumers. And when consumers have a choice, to choose how they want to be protected, they choose not to give out their personal information. But that and is that the point. But that, that's neutral. what they're doing. But I mean, like, I, yes, yes, in reality, yes, given the choice, but they don't have a choice. If this happens, then the only legal uses for Bitcoin will be this type of use, where you are disclosing all of this information. So that's what I'm saying is that in the world that we live in, if this happens, is it better to keep using Bitcoin and still disclose all that information because you're going to have to anyways if you're in New York and under the subject of all this nonsense? Or is it better to create something that kind of bakes it in? And, and more importantly, what will people who are not us and who are not in this for the ideology of it think thanks for listening to episode 134 of let's talk bitcoin content for today's episode was provided by andreas m antonopoulos jeffrey tucker and adam b levine this episode was edited by denise levine and adam b levine music for today's show is provided by jared rubens gertie beats and general fuzz if you're a developer you might be interested in our upcoming coins for commits program as the platform goes open source in the coming weeks, we'd like as much help as possible, and you'll earn LTBC for your commits. If you have any questions, send an email to adam at letstalkbitcoin.com, and I'll help you find the right person to speak to.